Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And Skyrim is a game offering both a massive world and narrative for players to lose themselves in. Yes, Bethesda hit something special when writing The Elder Scrolls V. And one of the things that makes exploring this setting so enthralling is the incredible number of intriguing questions it leaves us asking. Indeed, our thirst for answers is often satisfied. We eventually learn what's going on with the Return of the Dragons, who Windhelm's killer is, and why Sibyl Stentor is so weird. However, there are also a seemingly equal number of inquiries Skyrim leaves us with that it never reveals the truth behind. So today, whether it's the origins of some of Tamriel's more odd creatures, or the reality of what really happened to a certain game antagonist, we'll be taking a look at five more Skyrim mysteries. Episode 10. My golly, are there really 50 of these? Starting off, Spriggans are seemingly half-human, half-tree organisms the Dragonborn can encounter throughout Skyrim's various forests and caves. They make for odd enemies, boasting the ability to summon wild animals to aid them in combat, as well as invisibility and healing spells. They're always hostile, yet their employment of the arcane arts and other behaviors suggests that they're a good deal more intelligent than most of the non-human foes we face in the wild. So, where do they come from? Well, admittedly, Skyrim itself doesn't give us much to work with when considering this question. There's no in-game books that offer much, nor can we engage in any dialogue with characters who have insight. The creatures are barely mentioned in the loading screen. However, lucky us, Skyrim isn't actually the only Elder Scrolls game these wooded characters have made an appearance in. In Oblivion, we could find them protecting the forests of Cyrodiil, where they sported a much more feminine, human appearance. And their audio files even resembled that of a giggling woman. Take a listen. <laughs> Unfortunately, Oblivion didn't give us much additional insight into these creatures either. However, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's Blood Moon DLC, we did get a chance to face off against them on the island of Solstheim, where they again used that much more humanoid appearance. Thankfully, during the events of this DLC, the local Skull Nords on the island would bring up the beasts, citing them as a bit of a nuisance, and claiming that they believed Spriggans were created when their god, a monotheistic being known as the Allmaker, breathed life into the world, and accidentally breathed a bit too much into some trees, resulting in these beings. The Skull religion is far from right about everything, however, and they have myths and legendary explanations about nearly everything, making it difficult to take their explanation literally. Furthermore, the Blood Moon DLC wasn't even the first time Spriggans made an appearance in the franchise. While they for whatever reason didn't appear in Vanilla Morrowind, they were an enemy in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, where they debuted as such, and it's that game that perhaps offers us the most information on this topic. You see, there's a quest in Daggerfall called The Hunt for a Spriggan, where a group of loggers hires the player to go hunt down a Spriggan that's been attacking them whenever they go to chop wood. Ultimately, when you finally located the organism, rather than attack you, it would instead talk and explain those loggers were killing its seedlings. The creature would then ask that you go back to the hunters and get them to knock it off. In the end, the choice would be yours. You could kill the Spriggan anyway, go back to the loggers and kill them instead, or broker a deal where the woodsmen would agree to only chop down fully grown trees and avoid the saplings. So evidently, at least originally, Bethesda designed these creatures as capable of speech, very intelligent, and relatively peaceful. In that game, Spriggans also looked a lot more like they did in Skyrim. Overall though, despite varying levels of insight, it seems none of the Elder Scrolls games provide a true, definitive backstory to these mysterious guardians of Tamriel's nature. Maybe the Elder Scrolls VI will give us a bit more to work with. Next on our list, will Alduin return? And if so, when? Alduin is definitely among Skyrim's more notable villains. He's kind of the main one, 
and poses an existential threat, not just to us, but possibly all of Tamriel. Thankfully, after a final showdown in Sovngarde, where the Dragonborn defeats him once and for all, the problem is solved. Right? Well, as you may have noticed, after the dragon is defeated in the Nordic Afterlife Realm, something peculiar will happen. The player won't absorb his soul. This can be seen as rather odd, due to the fact that we're supposed to absorb every dragon soul we kill. And if we didn't take Alduin's, then where did it go anyway? We can bring this question up to Arngear, the only member of the Greybeards who actually speaks, after the main questline has been completed, and ask him what he suspects happened to the World Eater's soul. And the answer he'll give is quite terrifying. In response to the question, Is Alduin really dead? I did not absorb his soul. He'll say this. Perhaps. Perhaps not. Dragons are not like normal mortal creatures, and Alduin is unique even among dragon kind. He may be permitted to return at the end of time to fulfill his destiny as the World Eater, but that is for the gods to decide. You have done your part. This implies that not only does nobody have the slightest clue what happened to Alduin's soul, but there's good reason to believe he may be back sometime in the future. Oddly enough, if this is the case, it wouldn't be the first time Alduin was defeated only to return. You'll recall the dragon used to basically rule over all of Skyrim alongside his fellow winged friends. Until some Nords revolted. Those Nords killed or drove out most of the other dragons, but Alduin himself couldn't be defeated so easily. Instead, they just sent him forward in time after they did some magical stuff with an Elder Scroll. Forward in time to the year 201 of the Fourth Era, to be more specific. So, by now, Alduin's probably used to this. Going into a bit of a meta sense, this means that if Bethesda wanted to, they could have the character make a reappearance in the Elder Scrolls 6, either as the central antagonist yet again, or feature him as one of the major DLC villains. Though, I suspect the community would prefer the conflict with the Thalmor be further explained before anything else. Whatever the future holds for the dragon that so captured our imagination and fury in Skyrim, be it a glorious second, or I suppose third, coming, or nothing at all, only time will tell. Coming at number three, speaking of the Thalmor that we just mentioned, what do they know about the Dragon Priests? Let me provide some context. The quest, Siege on the Dragon Cult, has to be one of the more interesting stories in Skyrim. The TLDR is that, when approaching the ancient Nordic ruin of Ferelhost, you'll be met by a High Elf, calling himself Captain Valmir. He'll claim to be a high-ranking member of whichever Civil War side you're on and order you to enter the ruin and secure the mask worn by the dragon priest inside, because General Tolius or Ulfric Stormcloak need it for some reason. It's some obviously shaky logic, but hey, another quest, right? After you've cleared the dungeon and defeated the dragon priest inside, who will drop the mask Regat, as you exit, you'll see Captain Valmir now donning the armor of the opposite Civil War faction, trying to convince someone else to do the same thing. Clearly he's lying, and when he spots you, realizing you're onto him, he'll turn hostile. Once you've murdered the elf to death, the quest will be completed. On his body will be a note, revealing Valmir is in fact a Thalmor agent who's been sent to Ferelhost to find the Mask of Regat, and then bring it back to a place called the Labyrinthian. And this is where things get very interesting. Because while the quest may be over, the location it mentions is very significant. The Labyrinthian is an ancient Nord ruin that, in its heyday thousands of years ago, was a truly bustling city ruled by the dragons and their priests. When we find it in Skyrim, there will be a small structure we can enter, called the Broomjar Sanctuary. It contains a number of busts, one for each of the vanilla game's eight dragon priest masks. 
And when we, the player, have placed each mask on its respective bust, a mechanism will trigger and will be rewarded with a new, unique Dragon Priest mask called Kanarik. This whole ordeal isn't connected to any quests itself, it's more of a hidden, secret objective for us to pursue on our own time. So, this all leads us to ask, what on earth do the Thalmor know about it, and why are they trying to activate this? Is the Dominion aware of the Kanarik mask they'll obtain if they're able to come up with all of the other Dragon Priest helmets? It's not super powerful, so if they are, I still question their intentions. Is there something else the Thalmor are after related to the priests? We know from documents found at the Thalmor Embassy that they are just as confused as the rest of Tamriel regarding the return of Alduin and his dragon onslaught, so it's very unlikely that whatever they're pursuing pertains to that. Whatever the High Elves' true ambitions are, only they know, and they aren't talking. For fourth spot, I'll just jump right into this one. What the heck are Reiklings? I mean, more specifically, what are their origins, where do they come from, and why are they exclusively found on Solstheim? It is worth pointing out, Reiklings were also featured as foes we could cross paths with in Morwen's Blood Moon DLC as well, which likewise took place on Solstheim too. So this is both a Skyrim and Morwen related mystery, I suppose. Much like the Spriggans we covered earlier, the creatures are clearly far more intelligent than your average animal. Boasting advanced camps and structures, using tools, having developed their own, albeit primitive sounding language, and even possibly worshipping their own gods. So again, I must ask, how did these fellows get here, and how are they so smart? Well, there's two main theories that might explain this away. In Blood Moon, we're introduced to the suggestion that Reiklings are in fact the descendants of Snow Elves by the local Skull tribesmen, as well as some Altmer academics. Now, you'll note that the Falmer we encounter in Skyrim are actually also the descendants of the ancient Snow Elves, and none of the people who tell us Reiklings are Snow Elven descendants seem to even know that Falmer exist. However, that doesn't necessarily render this theory incorrect. For one, it's consistent with the fact that there aren't any Falmer on Solstheim at all, just Reiklings. Both creature types have a knack for living underground, domesticating local wildlife, and don't like people all that much. Though Reiklings look way different than their snow elven ancestors and there is no explanation offered behind what would have caused them to evolve so radically differently. This leads me to suspect that such a theory is incorrect. The other argument, which I do find a good bit more compelling, is that Reiklings are just a unique species of goblin. We don't meet any goblins for ourselves during the events of Skyrim or her expansion packs, however, they were a common enemy we can find inhabiting Cyrodiil back in Oblivion. Goblins seem to sport a similar society, and likewise were quite the nuisance. The games themselves never make any connection between the two organisms directly, however, it is worth noting that in the Elder Scrolls Online, we could encounter Reiklings living on Skyrim, and they had the exact same appearance as goblins, just painted blue. And in Skyrim itself, the Reikling models we see are really just blue painted over goblin models that Bethesda had created, but never implemented. So the beings are likely far closer related to goblins than snow elves. Though again, all of our evidence is purely visual. This could in theory just be an instance of the devs reusing assets for efficiency purposes. No matter, however these little blue fellows came to be, is likely a tale now well lost to time. And finally, last on our list, who is Zrib? You likely aren't very familiar with that name, so allow me to explain it first. Just north of a Fulmer cave slash dwarven ruin in the Pale called the Sightless Pit, there's an unmarked altar we can visit that seems to be of Dwemer origin. All around it will be large piles of bones, and a skeleton will be lying on the altar's surface that, when approached, will resurrect and turn hostile. 
Next to where the skeleton lay is also a book titled Doors to Oblivion, which is commonly held in the possession of necromancers. Considering the book and resurrected skeletons, it's safe to say that some type of necromantic ritual was once performed here. But little else is obvious. However, in Skyrim's official game guide, a physical book sanctioned by Bethesda, this unmarked location is referred to as the Altar of Zrib. Now, this is very strange, as this structure was clearly built long ago by the dwarves. And the dwarves didn't worship any gods in the first place, let alone one named Zrib. Not that they didn't believe in gods, they just saw themselves as equal, which is admittedly a little bit arrogant, but nonetheless, what's going on here? Could it be the necromancer using this altar was doing it in service to a being by that name? Things get even weirder if we enter that sightless pit, because inside of this cave, we can find the entrance to a dwarven ruin, known as the Temple of Zrib. This dwarven ruin is occupied exclusively by Fulmer. This means that Zrib clearly isn't the name of the being that whatever necromancer was using that altar was praying to, but instead likely the name of some being being honored either by the dwarves or perhaps the Fulmer. Again though I must stress, the dwarves didn't like worshipping any gods, so perhaps they were honoring a king by the name of Zrib or something to that effect. The Falmer are a whole nother story, we have no idea of their own religion and pantheon. Though it is likely they have one, considering all throughout the ruins and caves they occupy, we can find odd ceremonial totems. So is Rib a dark, evil god worshipped by the Falmer, or was it some being the dwarves wanted to pay homage to so long ago? For outsiders like us, it's likely we'll never know the truth. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five more mysteries in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Real quick, in that pinned comment down below, I will be linking our Discord server. We're trying to build up some more activity there, and are also looking for mods and staff. So if you're interested in chatting, or helping out there, give it a look, por favor. It would be very much appreciated. And what are your own theories or potential explanations behind some of the compelling questions we explore today? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings and subscriptions are also very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.